good evening all it's uh, i think another exciting session from uae branch we got 800 plus uh, participants already registered uh, for the event and in zero minute like six o'clock we got 243 already logged in and many more to come this is a webinar and uh, uh, unlike the zoom meeting all the q a session should be in the q a uh, chat box so as ben has informed you have the q a chat box where throughout the presentation you have any questions you're gonna use the q a and i'm here to moderate the q a sessions and myself and uh, lauren liski would be more than happy to assist you to answer to all the questions now uh, today's topic the fundamentals of fire and we got uh, an expert who has served in fire service, who is heading the AMROC EHS department, Mr. Lauren Leske here, to really give us more information on fundamentals of fire. I can assure you guys, you're gonna really enjoy his presentation. I'm sure fire is one of the hot topic, especially during summer. Uh, for all the members, non-members, now the stage is handed over to Lauren Leske. Sir, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much for all attending. Uh, I greatly appreciate that. Um, I'm Lauren Liske. Uh, in a couple of slides, I'll give you a little more information about myself. Um, I find fire is a significant topic due to the risk and the impact that it can have on life, people, business, property, and reputations. I find fire fascinating. I've been in the fire services for a number of years. Um, what I have found with fire is it's been my experience that fire is not really understood by everyone. You know, we have a tendency to see things, but we don't actually question the things that are happening uh, in behind the ob obvious aspect. And that's really what I want to touch on today is what's really happening behind the, um, the, the scene, so as to speak. Uh, okay, so um, we'll get into this. Main reason I'm looking at the fire, fundamentals of fire is because once you understand this, if I can get this to go, um, once you understand the fundamentals of fire, you'll be understanding how a fire grows, how it can progress, how it can grow, um, become a, more of a hazard. Now, for myself, I worked in the fire services over a decade and I retired as a fire chief from the Chestnut Fire and Rescue in Canada. Uh, got a bachelor's degree in fire protection. Um, got an associate degree in environmental and occupational safety. I was accredited by IFSAC as a fire service instructor for one and two. Um, had numerous fire and emergency rescue courses. Um, so I gave me a brief history of myself in regards to the uh, my work experience in the fire industry and stuff. Um, for today's topic, we've got some definitions for you in regard to the importance, the fire tetrahedron, as well as the fire triangle, understanding fire and uh, some of the fire properties, explaining some of the things that happen behind the scenes in fire, such as surface to mass ratio, radiant feedback, which I think are very important. And a lot of times we don't even consider what those aspects have as a impact to fire, uh, the various stages of fire, and then we'll do the summary on this. So, Definition, uh, the one thing I find about definitions is depending on what your source is for the definition, uh, it can vary, but for fire, it's a rapid oxidization process accompanied by heat and light. Um, we, to fully understand the nature of fire before we can develop an appropriate way to control the hazard. Um, so we won't have time to cover everything in today's uh, short time frame but we will talk about what is the fundamentals and what I think is really critical for fire growth and how we can now look at that fire growth and implement some control measures or in some cases preventative action. So some of the definitions, pyrolysis, this is the thermal decomposition of materials at elevated temperatures in an inner atmosphere. Basically says anything organic when it's heated will give off temperature that the vapor can mix with oxygen and that can burn. Uh, the different types of uh, heat transfer, which is conduction, which is direct, through direct contact, such as um, say a pot on a stove, conducting the heat through it into the contents of the pot. Your convection, it's through a medium such as air or water where we're actually using 
a medium to transfer the heat uh, to another location. And lastly, radiation. Uh, that's transferring a form of heat and light. Uh, so I'm hoping that everybody's familiar with the fire triangle. That they've had that exposed as a very fundamental course of a uh, number of the courses that are out there. Oxygen, heat, and fuel. Uh, you will get different definitions on this. Sometimes they call it oxygen or air with the heat. Sometimes they talk about heat or ignition sources, uh, your fuel. Uh, one interesting thing about the fuel is we talk about different types of fuel, but the fuel for it to actually be involved in a fire has to be in the vapor state, and we'll talk about that a little more. So with ambient air, we have 16% that required for supporting oxygen, which that number is kind of critical when we talk about some of these systems that have a monitoring of less than 16% oxygen, such as 15% in high value storage and things like that, where the fire can't sustain itself. Uh, our heat, our ignition sources, um, again, a number of them, just open flame, sparks, chemical energy, uh, gases, whatever can be generated to heat for it to actually trigger the vapor to ignite and the fuel. So we have gases, we have liquids, we have solids, um, a lot of different fuel sources, but the key thing to remember on that is this, the chemical chain reaction. And the reason I say it's critical on this is that in most environments, we already have oxygen, we may have electricity in the room, and we have fuel, we may have paper or whatever, but there's no fire, there's no interaction between the three. And that's where the chemical chain reaction is, and that's where the fire tetrahedron takes over from the fire triangle. The, basically saying that the three, oxygen, heat, and fuel, have to interact somehow. And that interaction is what we're kind of targeting. So the fire process. Now we have a solid in this uh, example. I like to use the candle because it kind of takes in all three. So we have a solid, we have a liquid, and we have a gas, and we have oxygen. Now the one thing that we'd like to look at is the solid is being heated by the candle, the flame. The flame is melting the solid into a liquid. It's continuing to heat the liquid. It turns that liquid into a vapor. That vapor mixes with the oxygen and that vapor oxygen mixture is actually what burns. So when we say a candle burns, what we're actually trying to say is the heat melts the solid to the liquid. The liquid gets heated continuously. It then turns into a vapor. That vapor is heated, mixes with the oxygen, and that's what burns. And that's why a candle can burn for a long period of time. Uh, if you took a piece of string and lit it on fire, the string just burns. If you hold a match to the, the wax and take the match away, the wax is gonna go out. So um, when you first light a candle, it's a slow process, but after it gets lit, that vapor is what continues to burn. And I have a little video on that. And this is interesting, and it's, uh, I selected this video because I'm trying to get you to understand that it's not the solid, it's not the liquid, it's the vapor that actually burns. So they'll reignite the smoke coming off of this candle with the flame slightly higher than the candle. So you understand that it's the vapor that's burning. Now, remember, this is an ongoing process that the flame will heat the solid, turn it to a liquid, reheat the liquid, turning it to a vapor. That vapor is what we want to see burning, right? So you could light the wick at this point, or you could light the vapor, and they'll light the vapor here, and you'll see that it'll track back down to the wick. Okay, so, it's very important to realize and understand it's the vapor that burns. So, you know, ever since uh, you children, you've probably seen paper burning. What's actually happening with the paper burning is it's undergoing the pyrolysis, which means thermal energy is changing it. It's giving off the vapor. That vapor has to mix with oxygen. Oxygen doesn't mix that well with solids or liquids. That oxygen mixes with the other vapor. That combination is what actually burns. Okay, so of the three sides of the triangle, 
Do we have fire? Fire needs oxygen. Fire will seek out oxygen. It will draft it to it to keep it alive. Fire uh, requires at least 15% oxygen, or sorry, 16% oxygen to sustain itself. And it is desperate for oxygen, just, just like people are desperate for oxygen. I have a little video about that. And what you'll see in this video is that oxygen has a huge impact to the fire. It starts to look for the oxygen and it will um, track it back. So when you have a fire in a building, that fire is looking for oxygen. I'll go to the next one here. This is a, a larger scale. If you want to see these on YouTube or whatever you can, these are called fire vortexes, fire tornadoes. You can influence a fire by oxygen. Right? And the thing about it is fire will go looking for an oxygen source. It will burn through doors. It will heat up windows. As soon as it finds that oxygen source, the unburned vapor will mix with that and it will want to propagate. Right? So that's understanding the oxygen. The reason the oxygen is critical is because we're not going to control a lot of the oxygen sources that are out there because it's, you know, 21% in the uh, ambient atmosphere. So unless we can reduce the oxygen below 16%, we're not going to be able to impact fires much before they start with reducing oxygen. Right? After they start, we can impact it by reducing the oxygen, but beforehand, there's a lot of air out there. Okay. Next one is the heat, sometimes called an ignition source. So any heat source or spark, right? Um, friction, electrical, smoking, static electricity, uh, batteries, hot work. There are a lot of ignition sources out there. And those ignition sources are something we can actually control. And it's great if we can look at them and identify potential ignition sources before they actually happen because if we can we can reduce the risk of having a fire right um so looking at your your heat sources um some of the ways that we can actually look at reducing potential ignition sources is thermal imaging on electrical panels, uh, loaded electrical circuits, even electrical equipment. Um, with our permits to work, we can reduce the uh, chances of having a fire by following the permits to work, uh, controlling uh, the policy with the uh, people smoking inside buildings, uh, people burning oud, anything like that. Uh, even with the battery, you know, it's uh, controlling the charging stations, uh, even storing equipment with batteries in it. Those batteries can corrode and cause problems, right? Fuel, again, this needs to be in the vapor state. Anything organic will burn. Uh, when I went to university, they told us there was only seven substances in the world that wouldn't burn. They listed them for us and we, we challenged a few of those, but uh, you know, it's surprising what you find out when you dig a little deeper. We said, you know, earth, uh, doesn't burn, but there are different types of earths. There's peat moss, which does burn. There is um, of the twigs and decayed vegetation in the earth, which is considered part of the soil, and it does burn. Um, for the fuel, liquid fuel points and flash points, I brought these up just to give you an idea, the temperatures they would ignite at, okay, and that's their flash point. So gasoline is 42%. Alcohols, they range between 16 to 50, 35 uh, degrees Celsius. Cooking oils, 149 to 232. Kerosene, 37. Acetone, 17. Um, when you look at some of your ignition sources, you know, cigarettes, uh, they burn around 230 degrees, more than enough to, to uh, uh, ignite a lot of these sources. When you do look back at the cooking oils, though, you're going to find that you need to heat those cooking oils for them to reach their sustain point, where they would sustain fuel, or sorry, sustain combustion on that. Uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, solids and their ignition paper, ignition temperature, sorry. Uh, newspapers, we're looking at 232 degrees, filter paper, 232, cotton fabric, 232, wood, 325, sawdust, 240, 260. It's interesting when you look at the wood because wood and sawdust basically are 
products of wood, but when we change the surface mass ratio, we can change their ignition temperatures as well. And I will talk a little bit about that in the next few slides. So surface to mass ratio, okay. The larger the, the object that has restricted oxygen to it, the more it's going to be difficult to ignite. So if you take a log and you try to light it with a match, you're going to find it's very difficult to ignite. Even boards, they're a solid surface, difficult to ignite. You get uh, take those boards and you cut them down into toothpicks, a little more easier to ignite because we've exposed more surface area where as it's heated up, that surface area gives off vapor, that vapor mixes with the surrounding oxygen and it allows it to burn easier, which just by that concept, when you get down to sawdust, it's going to even be more readily burnable than the toothpicks, but that sawdust needs to be suspended in air or anything because if you try to ignite it when it's in a pile, it's just like trying to ignite the boards or the logs, but when you suspend it in air, it's much easier to ignite and that's where our dust explosions become a problem for us because as the dust is the uh, smaller particles are suspended in the air, there's a lot of oxygen around them and as they burn, they heat up the surrounding particles and those will contribute to the fire heating up the surrounding particles around there and it becomes a cyclic little event where it propagates. With a dust explosion, it'll also knock dust off of rafters uh, from components and stuff and that will then have a significant knock-on effect and probably a second explosion which would be bigger than the first explosion which again will knock more dust off of rafters and things so it becomes very problematic on that especially if you're in an industry such as a flour mill um, or grinding of rice or anything like that where it powderizes anything Okay, so here's just a little bit about the surface to mass ratio and a simple explanation on this is newspapers. If you take newspapers and you put them in a stack and you try to light them on fire, top page may burn away, it'll uh, smolder along the outside edges and another page burns away, another page burns away. But if you take that same amount of newspaper and you crunch it up into balls, throw it into a corner and throw a match on it, it's going to uh, burn very readily because of the surface to mass ratio has been increased and the oxygen available to get to the vapor coming off. Right. So the nature fire, a fire typically wants to grow vertically and usually that's in the up direction due to hot gases. And again, if you look at, back at the candle, the vapor wants to go up. The flame wants to follow that vapor because it's looking to mix that with oxygen. And when it mixes it with oxygen, that mixture is what's flammable. And that is what propagates the fire. Okay. Um, fires will grow horizontally, but usually slower than vertically. And fire will also grow uh, down, but again, slower than it will grow up because it's trying to follow that vapor trail. And that vapor trail is, I won't say lighter than air, but it's less dense than the surrounding air because it's been heated and it wants to migrate up, okay? Next thing about nature fire is when we test a lot of products, we test them in a certain orientation. And uh, what I'm saying by this is um, if we test the flammability of carpet, we'll put it on the floor and we will test the flame spread on the carpet. But if you take that same carpet and you put it on the wall as wainscoting or maybe something protective from shopping carts hitting it or, uh, you know, uh, a decoration, that would propagate fire faster than if it was on the floor. So when we look at items that we purchase, we need to use them in the orientation they were designed at because that's what their flame rating is rated on. Okay. So surface to mass ratio and orientation of fuel matters. So if you look at our left-hand picture here, we have some pallets and the surface to mass ratio has been increased because the oxygen available within the pallet, it will burn more readily and quicker than the wood on the right hand side because it's flat, it's horizontal, very limited oxygen in between the boards, just what's on the surface can get to the, uh, the vapor and mix with it. Okay. 
surface to mass ratio in liquids. The same principle can be applied to combustible liquids. So diesel in a container, limited surface area, as we heat it, only what comes off the surface of the diesel can mix with air and burn. But if we take that same diesel, right, and we atomize it through, say, a mister, we are taking that diesel, we are making it into smaller molecules, just like we took the log and made it into sawdust. And again, the oxygen can mix with the outside vapor coming off of the individual droplets and much easier to burn, right? Um, you'll probably see this a lot with cooking oils. You know, you have to heat cooking oils for them to reach their flash point. You keep heating them, they will reach their auto ignition temperature. But at one point they will release their light vapors and those light vapors are what wants to burn. It's got to mix with the oxygen, you know, again, controlling that, simple enough cover it, limit the amount of oxygen that can get to a cooking oil fire. Okay. Radiant feedback. Now, a lot of people talk about radiant heat from the fire, but to get you to truly understand what we're trying to communicate with radiant feedback, it's that as a fire burns, heat is given off. The longer the fire burns, the more heat being given off. That heat can heat up surrounding fuel sources into a vapor, that vapor can then mix with oxygen and it can join in the fire, right? The longer a fire grows and is hotter, the more difficult it is to put out and the more we have a cyclic action from the radiant feedback. I have a little video for you on that. Okay, so again, we'll touch base on the three methods of heat um, transfer. So we've got heat being convected up on the air, through the air to the ceiling. You can see the smoke in the corner there. It's being conducted through the walls as it heats the inner wall. That heat will progress through the, the wall panels to the other side. As the heat hits the ceiling tiles, it will heat up. It will then be conducted through the ceiling tiles as well. We're getting some radiant heat coming off there. It's heating up the surrounding items uh, around the fire, as well as some of that heat from the ceiling is starting to radiate back down into the room to heat up other things. You can see the smoke starting to pool up there. Remember that smoke, that vapor is looking for oxygen. That vapor oxygen mixture, that's really what's burning, right? Now you can see the back of the chair is starting to heat up. That's from the radiate heat coming back down from the ceiling the smoke coming off the desk, that's the radiant feedback from the ceiling, heating up the other items, that's giving off fuel. And that fuel is in the form of vapor, mixing with the oxygen, that combination is what's burning. Now on the left-hand side, you see some file cabinets. Uh, you'll see a little green arrow come into the picture in a minute. And watch where the green arrow is pointed to. You're gonna see some vapor coming off of the papers in there. Sorry, it's a little technical glitch here, but it'll come back online. Um, and without the flame ever touching that, it will burst into fire. And that's the radiant feedback. That's what we're trying to control. So in the early stages of the fire, that's when you want to extinguish the fire, right? Because that's the easiest time. There's not a lot involved with it. It's not giving off a lot of radiant feedback, and it's easy to extinguish. So on this next one, um, this is where they've taken a log. Now there's a concept that one log won't burn and the reason one log won't burn by itself is because there is no radiant feedback. The heat doesn't radiate out and then radiate back to it. So on the left, they've cut the log into um, six pieces. That gap between the pieces is gonna create the radiant feedback. And you can see on the right hand side how that heat bounces back and forth and uh, propagates the fire. It just keeps it going, keeps it going. Now, if it was surrounded by other logs and stuff, this is where the radiant feedback would heat up surrounding logs and the fire would grow based on the fuel load that's there. All right, so the stages of a fire. It's typically four stages of a, of a fire. Some people classify it as three, some people class it as four. In the fire services, we classify it as four. So it's the incipient growth stage, 
if you want to consider it the early stages, the, uh, the infancy stages, that's fine. That's the easiest time to extinguish a fire. And the reason you would try to extinguish a fire, even if you don't extinguish it, is because if you can uh, interrupt or inhibit that stage, it gains you time. It gains you time for people to evacuate out of the building. It gains you time for the fire department to be notified and travel to it. You know, even closing doors and windows limits the growth of the fire, right? Second stage is free burning. The fuel sources have reached their auto ignition temperature and the fire can sustain itself as long as it has the components of the fire tetrahedron. And it's fully developed, it's growing. It's using up most of its fuel. It's got most of the fuel involved in the fire. Very difficult to extinguish at this point, right? And lastly, we have the decay stage. One of the four elements, oxygen, heat, fuel, or the chemical change reaction has been impacted. Uh, when I was in the fire services, you know, we'd come back and the a concept of, wow, we fought that fire for, you know, four hours, we finally won. No, guys, the, the, the fuel sort of burnt itself out and, you know, all that was left was the other three sides of the, the triangle, right? So, you know, um, a lot of it is how you perceive these. Now, the reason you look at these and the reason we've talked about this today is because we need you to go back and look at your facilities, determine what your fuel loads are, how you can reduce them, how you can uh, look at controlling your ignition sources. So just to talk a little bit about the fuel sources, you know, if you have cardboard boxes orientation, surface to mass ratio makes a big difference. If you have cardboard boxes stored with gaps between them, again, that heat is going to radiate back and forth between the boxes. Um, if you stack them all together, great, because you're limiting the amount of oxygen that can get to the boxes, much like the concept of the newspapers that I discussed previously, where if the newspapers are packed very closely together, it's difficult for the oxygen to get in there, difficult for it to burn. Also, when you're stacking boxes, if you put them very close together, if you have a sprinkler system in the building, when there is a fire involved with that and you pre-wet them with the uh, sprinkler systems, the boxes usually collapse, the contents escape, and usually wind up putting the fire out uh, on its own. Sprinklers are not really designed for putting the fire out. They're really designed to control the fire until the civil defense or the fire brigade can actually get there. That's a concept between behind sprinklers. Um, some of the more advanced sprinklers are designed to put the fires out and even, you know, shut themselves off, say the ESFRs, for example. But the whole point behind the sprinklers and stuff is it's designed to give you time as well. Time for the civil defense to get there, time for people to get out of the buildings. They're not there to uh, necessarily uh, extinguish the fire. They're there, you know, and a lot of insurance companies will look at this and say, the benefit of sprinklers is we may have some water damage, but the whole building didn't burn up. And water damage is a lot less expensive to fix than replacing a building. Okay, so that's pretty much the concept of it for what I wanted to communicate today. Um, and we'll toss it open for questions. Uh, back to you, Deepak. It was uh, very well presented. Um, detailed presentation. Now we got 24 questions open okay. for you, Mr. <laughs> Lerner. <laughs> but see, uh, before I get into the questions now, since you were in fire service, uh, hardcore managing fire, you get an emergency, <laughs> you, you go in. Do you have some memorable experience or uh, kind of an experience which you would never forget, or something you would like to share? to us? You know, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, it wasn't really in the fire services. It was actually when I was in university and our professor told us that everything will burn pretty much. Uh, you have to have it in the right surface to mass ratio, for example. And one of the things that we did was uh, we wanted to try this theory ourselves. So we went back to one of the, uh, the guys in the program. His apartment was close by and our professor had told us that everything burns, you know, sawdust burns, pepper burns, coffee burns, dehydrated coffee burns. 
Coffee Mate burns. And he said, Coffee Mate, really tricky because Coffee Mate is mostly oil, but in a powdered form. And he was telling us that um, magicians use dehydrated carrots ground up into powder as their flash powder. So we wanted to try this ourselves to see what we could do. So we went to uh, my friend's house and we were opening up the cupboards and grabbing everything, you know, to try this. And uh, everybody grabbed something different that was powder and they put a candle on the table and you know, one guy was throwing uh, dehydrated coffee on the candle and it's flaring up quite nicely and everybody was sort of around the table in different directions. And um, one of the guys threw pepper onto the fire and it burned quite nicely, but some of the pepper went out the other side and uh, one of my friends inhaled the pepper and started sneezing and he had coffee mate. And when he threw it onto the, the little candle there, he lost his eyebrows from that one. You know, it just flared right up. So some of this stuff, it looks pretty mild, but I got to tell you, when it gets involved in the right scenario, it can flash over real quick. So that's why fire safety, even at home, is very important, not just in the construction site. It is. And if you go to YouTube, uh, there's a number of people who will demonstrate for you about the powders that will burn and how they burn. You know, some of the ways they do it isn't the safest from the EHS point of view, right? You know, they're not wearing gloves or <laughs> yeah. vibrators, but they want to try this because they understand that it burns. So if you do try this at home, which I don't recommend, because that's how fires start. <laughs> Even if you try it outside, you're going to lose some eyebrows. Um, but uh, you can watch the videos on YouTube and you can see for yourself the different types of powders and the ignitability of those powders. Okay. Now, uh, let me go with the question. Sure. Uh, I know we have uh, limited time, so all the attendees, if you're not able to answer the question, definitely the response will be back by uh, email. So our uh, communication team would be getting back to you. Yeah. So now let me show the first question uh, to Laura. It's from Anshad Ansari, and you could do it live answer. So you're not typing again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> FM, <laughs> FM 200 application on normal electrical panels. Yes. Why it's not popular? Well, the thing about it is, especially with insurance companies, is they look at it that, yes, it will extinguish the fire, but if you can't reduce the electricity, and this, this is kind of a contention, sorry, I'll go off topic a little bit here, of with the UK's latest rating on fires for fire extinguishers, they've taken the electrical fire away. The problem is, is that, that I see the fire extinguishers are for the average person's manual extinguishment of fire and it lets us know what the hazards associated with the fire are, not necessarily what kind of fire we're fighting. So when you're dealing with an electrical fire and you cannot de-energize it for whatever reason, the, the uh, DB boardroom is locked, uh, the location where it's burning is downstream from a substation and it's your substation and you don't have the ability to, to de-energize it, then no matter what, it's still an electrical fire and that electricity is going to continue to heat the cables around the, the cords, that vapor coming off, that's what's burning on that. So the FM200, when you extinguish it into the room, it tries to extinguish the fire but even if it extinguishes, as oxygen comes back in, that fire is going to reignite because the basics of the fire are still there. Your heat source is still there. Your fuel source is still there. Your um, oxygen is come back into it. So the chemical chain reaction can restart. And that's why it's critical that you do de-energize it. But I've been in a number of situations where there is no way to de-energize it. It's a house fire. The panels to the house are inside. Your transformers are up the block. Fire services don't always have access to those. So sometimes you have to fight an electrical fire. Now the FM200 is a great way if it works and acts quick enough, but it doesn't cool the electrical, right? Um, a lot of the insurance companies look at sprinklering the fire or the um, electrical rooms. And the reason they do that is because first of all, if there's a fire in there, your electrical is cooked. So it's not really gonna matter if the, the water gets onto it. But two, it'll usually short it out as well so that the heat source is eliminated. Hopefully that answers the question for the person. 
Uh, also, FM200 systems are very expensive. You have to um, seal the room so that the FM200 stays in, so it needs to be um, pressure tested. Uh, so there's a lot of things associated with it and replenishing that because it will have a, a shelf life. So it becomes very expensive compared to say a sprinkler system. That's detail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> detail. So now, uh, fire evacuation is again uh, a major factors to be considered. So now yeah. we have a question. How much does structural aspects of building affects escape plan? What factors to be considered when determining the structural integrity? Well, you need to look at you, what your hazards are right, in, the, in the facility because if you're evacuating an office building, it's completely different than say if you're evacuating an aircraft hangar or if you're evacuating manufacturing plant. And again, the components that are in there. So each building is designed to meet the code. And when you read the fire code, you're gonna find that there are different occupancies, educational occupancies, um, uh, office occupancies, manufacturing occupancies, uh, things like that, where those occupancies have a different rating for things. So the sprinkler systems will be designed for that occupancy. Uh, so a manufacturing facility that manufactures plastics will have a higher um, density of uh, sprinkler systems than say for an office space because the worst that would be in the office space is some plastics in the ordinary desk, uh, some paper that's burning, you know, things like that. So you, you need to look at your occupancy. Based on your occupancy, you would then go to the, say the NFPA 101 um, Fire and Life Safety Code and make sure you meet the requirements there based on that. Ideally, your uh, evacuation routes need to meet the requirements. So they will say things like, uh, you know, maximum 30 meters in a dead end strip because that would trap people at the end of that if required or unfortunate. Um, your evacuation route needs to have fire ratings on the wall, such as staircases. They usually have fire rated doors. They have fire rated walls. So the staircase can actually be considered a safe haven. Uh, in the route to get out of the building. Uh, some of the corridors considered a safe haven. Um, when I first came to the UAE, I noticed that a lot of their staircases would take you down the center of the building and drop you in the lobby. That's not really a fire exit because it doesn't take you outside the building. Your fire exit should take you down and drop you outside of the building away from the hazard because you don't know where the fire is necessarily. It might be in the lobby and coming down the lobby, you wind up walking into a room full of smoke. And just as a side on that, that's our biggest risk in a fire is the smoke. Fires you can usually walk away from, it's the smoke that's going to put you down. Hopefully that answered his question. That, that, <laughs> that, 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 that. Now, uh, this is again a question which I would also ask uh, for Dubai is full of uh, sky, skyscrapers, vertical projects super high rise buildings. Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestion for fire evacuation? Right, well, um, when you look at the buildings, some of the buildings have newer technology that we never used to use. So we never used to use elevators as part of the egress out of the building in the fire evacuation. They've now changed that. They've made the elevator shafts fireproof. They use the elevators to come down to certain levels. So the design have changed over the years. Um, ideally, the staircases are your best option, but if you're, say, in the, you know, 150-story building, uh, that's a lot of stairs to be coming down. And uh, I'd rather be going down the stairs than going up the stairs, but even so, going down that many stairs, uh, if anything happens, because, again, you don't know where the fire is. And unfortunately, a lot of the fire apparatus can't get to the 150th floor or even the 100th floor. You know, usually it's 24th floor is the max stretch on the, uh, the fire apparatus aerial units. So you need safe havens within the building to shelter in while the 
fire department tries to extinguish the fire. And again, this is where everything that height would need to be sprinklered to control the fire until civil defense could get there to try and put the fire out. So you don't necessarily have to evacuate the building so much as get to a safe haven within the building. So uh, I would say a fire compartment or kind of a compartment room or an isolation facility within the building would be a better option rather than running all the way from up to down. Correct. Um, and that's what the staircases basically are. They're considered a safe haven. There's a number of systems now that you can put on the outside of the building to uh, evacuate the building. But again, if you're on 154 floors up and it's an outside staircase uh, or one of these ones where the patios come out and create staircases is going down. Um, that's if, if anything is affecting people or there's uh, panic or anything, that's kind of got a different aspect of risk to it besides the fire and the smoke. Answer. So now <clears throat> the questions are bombarding. We got 62 questions. When I was started, I said you have got 18, 24, now it's 62 questions. Okay. Here is uh, another interesting question. This is from Roshni Bokche. Sorry if I pronounce it wrong. Is there any chance of fire in the oven? because cooking oil flash point is 149 to 232 degrees and the oven temperature goes beyond this. Yeah, absolutely. So any of your flammable liquids, let's look at say cooking oil, you're heating it in the oven. You're gonna reach a point where it has a flash point. Now a flash point of that product is when you introduce a flame to it, it flashes across and then it goes out. You continue to heat that product and you will reach the auto ignition temperature where when a flame is introduced, or even if the flame isn't introduced, it will auto-ignite and continue to um, support combustion on the surface of it. So yes, you will have a fire in the oven, even though you'd have limited oxygen. The problem that you have, is, and this is where a lot of people make mistakes, you open the oven door to address it and the oxygen gets in and now the fire is out of control. So leaving it in the fire, let the smoke suffocate itself, just leave it in the oven, leave the door closed. Same with a lot of other aspects, like, you know, if you have a fire in the kitchen, you can't control it. Get out, close the door, let it try and suffocate itself. If nothing else, you gain time for yourself to get out of the house. Uh, if you did want to try and fight the fire, say it's on the stove or something, you don't necessarily want to open the door up completely. You're going to let all the oxygen in. You may just want to open the door a crack and shoot the extinguisher from across the room, especially if it's a dry powder one, trying to cover the surface of the, uh, the fire to restrict the oxygen from interacting with the vapor coming off. That's an informative. And uh, there's, there's another one. Okay. What is the fun, um, I'm bombarding you with questions because I'm being bombarded with Q &A in <laughs> okay, the Q&A no box. It has gone up to 74. It's like the oil price is going up down. So what is the fundamental difference between fire resistant and fire retardant material? Right. Well, it's kind of like looking at a watch. You can get a water resistant watch and you can get a waterproof watch, right? <laughs> so water resistant means it will resist water, but if you submerge it, the water's probably going to get past the seals and get into it. Waterproof means you can dive with it in the water. Same concept with your fire. So fireproofing versus fire resistant, or, you know, and a lot of times you're going to find that fireproof isn't really existent. It just means you have different times. So you can get fire doors that have a 30 minute rating. You can get fire doors that have a one hour rating, a two hour rating. Same with tarps and things like that. When you have fire resistant, you can get a fire resistant tarp for 10 minutes. You can get fire resistant tarps for an hour. So it's all based on the manufacturers, what they have tested it to, to will give you your um, comfortable range on what it will actually withstand for temperatures and how long before it burns through. Uh, since we're speaking on tarps, that's one solution, by the way, if you have no choice and you have to put a lot of fuel into an area. And when I say fuel, let's say it's cardboard boxes into one location and it's maybe too much for the sprinkler system or you don't feel comfortable with that large volume, but you know, hey, maybe stores got a deal on something, they put it in there. Uh, you can always put fire resistant tarps on them because again, you're gonna limit the amount of oxygen that's under that tarp. So you're doing the time distance and shielding. 
time distance and shielding pretty much works across most of the EHS and fire aspects. You are um, shielding the fire load from the oxygen. Okay, and uh, let me uh, again to all the uh, participants. The questions for chat box, let it be in chat box. Several questions in Q&A is more to be in the chat box. And I see in chat boxes, the Q&A sessions are there. Okay, now, uh, this question has always been me when I started the career. Even sometimes I'm still not able to find the answer. So I think I got the expert here. Can you please explain about metal fire and type of extinguisher for it? This is from Dr. Ashit Pitt. Okay, so remember what I said about surface to mass ratio. Anything taken down pretty much to a smaller uh, mass is ignitable. So steel in a steel bar does not burn. But you take that steel, you mill it down into steel wool, you can burn steel wool. Again, we've increased the surface to mass ratio on that. Now, when it comes to metal fires, you can get products like Metal X, things like that. They're specific for the metal. And the reason I say that is because if you put, say, water on magnesium, the magnesium burns so hot, it actually extracts the oxygen out of the water and uses that oxygen to combust. So your fire extinguishing agent needs to be relevant to the metal that you're using. So whatever product you're, you're, you're cutting or you're uh, welding on, if it's aluminum, there is uh, a fire extinguisher for aluminum. There's fire extinguishers for steel. There's fire extinguishers for um, galvanized metals. There's fire extinguishers for um, bronze, for gold. And some of them, you can get metal X, which works for say, you know, 70% of the metals that are out there, but some of them need to have specific uh, extinguishing agents. Sand is a good one for the general aspect, um, but you also got to remember that with the fires, there's some additional hazards to it, such as when you're uh, heating galvanized steel, the vapor coming off of that, again, it's going to be your biggest health hazard because there's toxins in that vapor, right? Hopefully that has explained it for you. It is, it is, yeah. Now, there are several questions. Like it has been in different forms, okay. but I think the answer, the, even the answer would be same. I think you could give a right answer. To calculate the fire, row, fire load of a building, so what are the factors to be considered when you're calculating the fire load? Well, a lot of times you, you're not necessarily going to calculate your fire load in that aspect. You're going to look at it. So. Um, most people are familiar with risk assessments. Risk assessments are you look at what your exposures are. And from your exposures, you're then going to look at ways that you can assess them, control them, and things like that. So a number of things that come into play with your fire risk assessments is what is your building designed for? What's the occupancy of the building? And this goes back to what I said before with the uh, NFPA 101 for life safety code, but you can go a little farther back into that, the NFPA codes and standards, where they talk about the sprinkler system designs for different types of occupancy. And that's critical because if you'd originally had a building that was designed for, um, say, educational purposes, and uh, a company comes in and says, you know what, we're going to retrofit this, we're now going to use it for, um, manufacturing and storage of products. That changes the fire loading on that sprinkler system. So calculating your fire loading, you need to look at what was the original design of the sprinkler system. And your sprinkler system may need some tweaking. Uh, your fire loading can be minimized or you can put it into rack storage. You can put sprinklers into the rack storage to again, increase the um, reduction of the fire growth. That brings into a factor another thing such as shelving in the sprinkler or the, uh, the rack system. Is it solid wood? Is it expanded metal? What's your best option? And again, it comes down to um, what's your sprinkler system designed for because you're going to want to try and pre-wet everything. Boxes, wet boxes are difficult to ignite, right? So when you calculate your fire loading, you need to look at what is your fuel source because it varies. If you're storing um, cardboard boxes with paper is different than if you're storing cardboard boxes with cooking oil in them, you know, in the plastic containers and stuff. 
So really a lot of this goes back to the insurance company. We have all the software and everything that can come in and say, right, you have 12 foot high storage. Uh, in it is cardboard boxes with cooking oil in it. Um, you have gaps between them or you have shelf storage. So they have calculations and design criteria for your rack sprinklers, for your ceiling sprinklers, or they will have a maximum height associated with that. So it all depends and it's not a simple answer because your fuel loading is different. And your fuel loading has a huge contributing factor on calculating your fuel loading. So, that, uh, it's I, mean, I, I mean, when you consider the fire load, it's about the uh, passive and active firefighting system plus the uh, and the uh, the load the uh, combustibles or the non combustible materials which are being storing in the facility. I think these two factors are the factors to be considered when you are doing the fire load of a building. You are, but the thing is, is I mean, ideally, your best bet is always keep the minimal amount of fuel in the building. So, for example, um, you can take flammable liquids into a building because it's part of a painting process. Mm -hmm. Again, rather than taking in 15, 45 gallon drums and increasing your fuel, you take in the minimum amount that you are going to require for a day use or a shift use or a two or a three day shift, rather than say you're going to put in a week's worth in there because it's easier to store, right? So you may want to have a disposable building outside, such as a shipping container that is air conditioning because a lot of your products need to be maintained at specific temperatures. But if that shipping container burns, it has next to zero impact on your operations in the building because you can always get more product for the process inside the building, but you've reduced the fuel load, you've reduced the risk to the building. Now, uh, it's like 105 questions open. Now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, now I have a question from uh, Prince Manova. The master ratio, I think it's surface ratio uh, says for sawdust requires higher energy for ignition. How is that as stated? When there is huge mass, it takes time to ignite. Can you clarify, sir? Sure. So again, the sawdust in different orientation can be higher or lower. So sawdust in a pile is difficult to ignite. And again, if you want to look at this, uh, they can go to YouTube. They can look at uh, one of the videos there from Science Girl, who's trying to burn all these different products. And she holds a match, or sorry, a uh, ignition source to powdered uh, flour, really difficult to ignite. But when you take that flour and you suspend it in the air, and this is where the exposure of each of the little dust particles mixes with the oxygen when it's heated and the vapor comes off. So you'll have a range of things that can, uh, can impact it, right? So you, you will always have a range. It's sort of like, um, we talk about diesel in a very generic terminology, but diesel made by say Chevron versus Adnoc, they can have different uh, ignition temperatures, they can have different flash points, but it's still a diesel product, so it slightly varies. Same thing with sawdust. So your sawdust is not a general one across the board because you have softwood and you have hardwood. So softwood is much easier to ignite than hardwoods are. Hardwoods take a little more energy to ignite them because they're more densely packed cellulose fiber and it heats it up to give off that vapor. So softwood is less densely packed uh, cellulose fiber, so it's easier to ignite. Right? Okay. So you're gonna have a range on the temperatures. That's, no, I think uh, we all need to wrap up but okay. there are still 104 questions. Uh, last but not the least, uh, I, I need to use the expert here. So we are all using hand sanitizer. And yep. There are several videos being circulated in social media, in YouTube, you've got too many chats coming in WhatsApp saying that don't leave your hand sanitizer in the car. Don't have your hand sanitizer and do the cooking, you, you get burned. So could you just uh, give a basic safety for hand sanitizer right well and again this is my opinion the, the perception i look at is it's an alcohol most alcohols are flammable at one point or another now leaving it in the car unless you have an ignition source 
that's going to activate. It's going to vaporize rather quickly and dissipate because of the heat in there. Uh, what we're finding most with the hand sanitizers in the car is that they're heating up. They're actually changing the chemical composition of the containers and making the containers a lot harder to use. So if it was a flexible container, it's changed it and now it's really stiff. Um, the problem with the hand sanitizer is, like, much like anything else, they are flammable, right, because they have an alcohol in them, but you, it still needs your ignition source, it still needs the oxygen, and it still needs the chemical interaction between them. So leaving it in the car, that, that's kind of a general statement, because if you have underground parking, you're not going to be out in the direct sunlight. So leaving it in the car is probably a misnomer. What they probably should be saying is, don't leave it in extreme temperatures because of you can pop the cap on it, release the vapor. Opening the door should not be a problem, right? Because you're not giving it an ignition source. Yes, the light may come on, but it's still gonna need that oxygen vapor ratio that's ignitable, right? With the, uh, sorry, the second part of the question was not for vehicles, but uh, using it in the uh, kitchen. Yeah, said, you're saying it. And again, it's an alcohol. If you're going to use it near a candle, right? If you're putting hand sanitizer and it's by the candle, you got your alcohol, you got your oxygen, you got your ignition source. Yeah, probably you will get burned, right? But using it in the kitchen away from the heat source should be no problem with that because again, the fire triangle, fire tetrahedron is broken apart because, you know, you can use it anywhere in the, in the front room. So, you know, if you're going to use it in your living room and you have a candle there. It's not the kitchen, but you still have your, your hazards. So you can't really classify it as per room. You need to look at the hazards associated with the fire tetrahedron. Do you have a fuel source? Do you have an ignition source? Do you have oxygen? And can they interact somehow? One of a long session. I think I have taken much of your time. It was very interactive, uh, in fact. Uh, there are uh, 110 questions more. I think I would be sharing it to you by uh, email and definitely would get back. There are some interesting questions. Okay. And, uh, thank you all. Let me, before signing off, uh, let me all remind that we have the election ongoing. So uh, before August 1st, casting your vote for the council members. And next presentation is again going to be another exciting one. Schools are going to reopen, so many parents would be worried how safe are they to send their kids back to school. We are having uh, the Vice President of OHS from GEMS uh, to discuss on what control measures as KHD, as schools in UAE are getting ready to get the uh, kids back to school safer. So don't miss the next uh, webinar as well. It was an interesting attendance list. We got almost uh, almost fifty percent of registered. Thank you all. Bye bye. Have a safe day ahead. Evening.